Listen to the new Thin Green Line podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Game wardens John Norris and Wayne Saunders talk about wildlife, the outdoors, law enforcement, environmental subjects mixed with current events and guests that are part of the Thin Green Line. And if you are one of those visual people like me, for $5 a month, you can see the actual podcast on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com and join us. The Copper Pig Brewery in Lancaster, New Hampshire, is brewing traditional and innovative high-quality beers, as well as serving a large menu of creative comfort foods, appealing to all walks of life, with daily specials sourcing many ingredients locally. Charitable involvement and support of their community is the cornerstone to the Copper Pig Brewery's mission. Voted number one in New Hampshire by WMUR Viewer's Choice two years in a row, 2018 and 2019. Please join me at the Copper Pig. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. Warden's Watch, Episode 49, John Anderson, Nevada. And we're going to be hearing from John as we go along in some great cases and how we got to this point of doing another Nevada interview. But down the road here shortly, you guys are going to be happy that I've done a lot of Nevada episodes of this podcast. You're going to really enjoy. You're going to go back and listen. You're going to start putting some faces with the names. It's pretty exciting. Um, Anyways, I'm going to dedicate this podcast to a Nevada game warden. Captain Brian Eller has just retired. Brian's one of those guys that kind of Sits on the sidelines. He doesn't, as much as he gets involved, he doesn't get involved. He is not a spokesperson. He is not one of those guys that gets the limelight, nor does he like the limelight. So when he went out, it was very quiet. Well, I'm going to make a little noise for Brian Eller because Brian is a dedicated game warden. Uh, he ran the Operation Game Thief program in Nevada. That's how I met him. He was part of the International Wildlife Crime Stoppers to the point of being a president and now a past president. Uh, He hosted the 2019 IWC International Wildlife Crime Stoppers Conference in Nevada, uh, Lake Tahoe. Uh, Great job, Brian. It was a great conference. Got a lot done there. That's where John Norris and I first met, and now we're working together. Um, And John's not here today. Yes. But next podcast, I'm sure he will be here, and he will be telling you what he's been up to, and he's been up to a lot. And I just want you to look at the Ducks Unlimited uh, podcast. John's just uh, been a guest on there. Episode, or, or part one of his episode has just been released. There'll be a part two. Listen to that. Get some more John Norris with the Ducks Unlimited guys. Great interview there. Looking forward to the second part. Just uh, 
Good. So uh, we'll be able to hear a lot of what John's doing. John's got a lot of irons in the fire, one of them including his knife. So if you're looking for a gift for somebody, that knife is outstanding. I've carried it this fall. I'll carry it this winter. I'll carry it next summer. Uh, The John Norris knife is just uh, an outstanding tool. So that's been great. Also, if you guys want some Warden's Watch stuff, you can go on our our website, wardenswatch.com hit shop and you'll be able to go get some merchandise there some uh t-shirts some uh some hoodies some other stuff whatever you like that's there where you team up with spread shirt and then uh they basically produce it item by item that's been working out okay so anyways uh dedication to a, a nevada interview to a nevada warden who has just retired captain brian eller thank you for your service thank you for your commitment to Nevada's wildlife. Thank you for your commitment to North America's wildlife, Brian. Really appreciate it. And we are going to hear some awesome stories out of Nevada with John Anderson. Just uh, had a great interview with John. Certainly didn't want to toot his own horn, so one of his fellow wardens reached out to me, and you're going to hear that story as well. Uh, Just a great opportunity. I have spent some time in Nevada, and these guys are awesome, enjoying it. I hope you will too. Episode 49, Warden's Watch. Thank you. So today's Warden's Watch episode is with John Anderson from Nevada. But kind of got hooked up with John in a kind of a different way that one of his uh, fellow game wardens reached out to me, Victor Jordan, and, and just said, hey, you know, John's got a really good case that, you know, I think would be awesome on Warden's Watch. And I just jumped on that right away, John, because uh, current cases, awesome cases, when another game warden thinks you have an awesome case, that's, that, that's, that's pretty complimentary. I will, I will say that when, when we get these cases, we're pretty proud of them. And sometimes we don't flaunt them ourselves. But when someone else reaches out to me and says, hey, you really should talk to John Anderson because he's got a really cool case that, that's pretty recent and I think you'd be willing to share. So, and, and thank you for joining us on Warden's Watch. And I really appreciate Victor reaching out and sharing that. And uh, uh, thanks for sharing your story and uh, your, your cases with us. Uh, Nevada's been kind of close to my heart. I've already done a couple with you guys and went out there for the IWC conference, uh, <laughs> the last conference we had in 2019. So just I uh, really appreciate your state and the people that work for your agency. Yeah, we have a, a small agency, but there's some talented people that work here. Um, a lot of really great wardens. And I give a shout out to Victor for giving me the opportunity to present that case. And um, it's kind of what I've been doing as a game warden. It's really neat. I've been following your podcast, uh, listening to all the episodes and just thinking, man, that'd be really cool to get on there. So shout out to Victor for, you know, giving me the opportunity to do this. Yeah, no, that's, that's like I said, it's the ultimate compliment when another game warden says, "Hey, you got to reach out to this guy because his cases really? are just uh, are, are are good," and it, and wants to share, and that's that's pretty uh pretty cool about wanting to share for sure. So, what is this case? Can you give it to us? And and I'm not a nutshell. I don't want to say a nutshell. I want, I want to hear details, man, because uh, I've got Victor's blood boiling. And I, I'm sure it's going to get mine going, and our listeners. Yes. <laughs> It's a, it's a really neat case. It's definitely the highlight of my career so far. I've been a game warden now for almost nine years. Most of it's been spent in this rural community, uh, south central uh, Nevada. It's a Lincoln County. This tiny little community called Panaka is where I live, but Lincoln County is more of a, a group of five communities. We border a county with millions of people, two million people, I think, and our county's got 5,000 people in the entire county. There's wow. five little towns and each one has about a thousand people. So everyone knows everybody. Um, and when something like this case happens, there's a lot of public interest. This, the economy of this county is significantly buoyed up by the hunting community um, mm. out of Las Vegas, out of Reno. These units that border Utah have the same, a lot of the same genetics and a lot of the same habitats as the Arizona Strip. So a lot of really big deer and really big elk. Um, mm. come out of these units that I patrol. And those units are unit 231, 241, 242, 221 through 223. Those are the kind of the main units I patrol. Um, and, and again, known for really big elk, really big deer. A lot of people, when they think of Nevada, they don't think of, you know, trophy, no. beautiful mountainous animals. You know, the units that, that I patrol 
are between 4,000 feet and 10,000 feet of elevation, mm. you know, desert sheet, antelope, all kinds of stuff. So this, this particular case was in unit 231. I'd been a game warden out here for about four years, and I got a call from a local landowner who said he was out in his field, just kind of looking around at his cows and saw two piles of brush. And he saw some crows and ravens on top of them. And he, he went over there and he, before he even got there, he could smell the stench. And you know, the stench I'm talking about. I do. <laughs> Rancid. You know, it's in, in Nevada in August, it's a hundred degrees. Oh. And so a pile of, of meat that's been sitting there probably about a week under sticks and stuff is just rancid. So he smelled that, gave me a call and said, Hey, there's, this looks really fishy. It's on my private property. I don't know what it is, but it stinks. And it <laughs> looks to me literally like <laughs> there's an animal underneath these piles of sticks and, and brush. And so I said, yeah, I'll be out there. It's about 10 miles from my house. No more than that. Probably 20 miles from my house as the crow flies. So I pull up to the property. And again, I can tell it right away. And I, I get out there and I start pulling these sticks off and immediately I can tell these are four quarters of a, of an elk and it's a large elk. It's a really big animal. Mm. Um, some of these bulls out here can be 800 pounds. So these are really big quarters and they're, they've deteriorated to the point where they're basically piles of maggots. Mm. Um, and you know what that's like digging into that. Yeah. It's no um, fun when it's, when it's warm and it's, it's stinky. Um, but that's the job we do as a game warden. So roll up your sleeves and dig in automatically. The crime that I had at that point was waste. I thought, Someone shot this bull elk on private property and decided they didn't want the meat or got spooked and left it. The fact that the, the sticks and stuff were on top of the piles made me think that they maybe were going to come back for it. Mm. Um, why else would they try to hide it? And they quartered it. So they went to the effort of, right. of removing the quarters. Um, didn't find the back straps, just all four quarters. So they took the back straps and then the pile. There was no head there. Um, and so we, I spent a couple hours trying to find a bullet. And this was one of the most liquidy <laughs> necropsies I've ever done. You know, you're pulling it up. It's like a, like, like the meat got barbecued and the meat's just falling off the bones. You know, you like pick it up and it's just, just falls off and there's maggots everywhere. And I'm digging through all that and I'm, yeah. it's hot and it stinks. And I, through all that, all I could find, I couldn't find any bullets. All I could find was some broken ribs where I could see a bullet had gone through, but mm -hmm. all my metal detecting and stuff, I wasn't able to find anything. And so I started, I mean, as a game warden, that's what we're looking for initially on a, on a case like that is some type of evidence. Right. Um, and I, so I was unable to locate a bullet, the head was missing. And so I started fanning out from there, you know, looking in circles around there, trying to find something else. And I came to about 200 yards away, there was a spot on the ground that looked like the elk had been cut up there, right in that spot. Mm. And so I started looking around, spent about 15 minutes, you know, digging, trying to find a bullet. I metal detected the area. And as I was metal detecting, I looked up, and this is where it gets pretty interesting. I looked up and about 50 yards away on a fence post was a camera pointed right at the spot where this elk had been cut up. As a game warden, you're like, no. <laughs> really like this whole thing was caught on a trail camera so i immediately went down to the landowner and was like hey like are these cameras armed and he's like yeah yeah I, um i <laughs> said have you looked at them yet <laughs> and he said no no i haven't so like a, a kid on christmas we uh, went down and got those cameras and he said like he a godsend the out there. <laughs> yeah uh the the landowner has the cameras out there because he can get landowner depredation tags based on the number of elk that are utilizing his fields. Ah. So he's doing it for proof so he can show us, hey, every night I got this number of elk that are coming in and, and we'll compensate him and give him a tag that he can sell mm. based on that. So he can compensate for his loss to his crops and stuff. Gotcha. So we, we plopped that SD card in, in his computer and started flipping through. And again, it was like, um, every, anything you could ever want was there. We had a spotlight coming into the field at like nine o'clock at night. You can see a big group of elk out there and the cameras pointed right at this beautiful bull and the spot, there's like two or three photos of the cameras panning across or the, 
the spotlight panning across this bull elk. And then there's a photograph of the elk halfway falling down. Oh, as is, yeah, you can. So, you we got the shot of him falling down at night in a spotlight on this camera, and then a couple photos of all the elk running away and the bull still being there. Then, about two hours later, you see um, into the field, and right in front of the camera comes uh, an ATV and two people riding on this ATV. And these, these photographs are kind of blurry, so you can't tell exactly who it is. Mm. Um, but you can tell it's two guys and they're young. They look like they're in pretty good shape and they're wearing flat brim hats. We, we kind of call the kids from Utah that come over here and, and do some kind of nefarious stuff. We call them the flat brim army. <laughs> so <laughs> it was just the classic young kids that, you know, so we're talking ball caps out. with flat brims. Yeah, we yep. call them the, yeah, the flat the flat brim army. I think I had something near 30 photographs of them then cutting it up, putting it on the four-wheeler, dragging it out of frame over to where we must have found the the carcass. Uh, it was it was a really neat get. There were two other cameras on the property that caught a couple other photographs of them just passing with the bull elk's head on the back of the ATV. And, and that in and of itself didn't solve our case because we didn't know who these individuals were, right? We just knew we had exact time stamps of when they were there, when it was shot. So now I knew that this animal, if they, there was an open elk season, but it was for archery. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that they could have shot from where the spotlight was to there with a bow. Mm -hmm. So we knew it was a rifle that they used. Mm -hmm. um, so now our, our, our crime's building a little bit. We uh, actually a lot. We have now we have two photographs of individuals or photographs of two individuals and the whole crime caught on, on trail cam. Uh, that's, the, that's um, not incredible. Probably not John. very many wardens can, <laughs> can say that like, you know, their entire crime was caught on camera. It'd be like you're hiding in the, in the bushes, taking photograph of the crime as it's occurring. Right. It was all there. Right. And again, the only thing we didn't have is who are these people? Right. So, um, what we did next was we did a media release with the photographs. We put out, in Utah, in, Nevada, in Southern Nevada, actually all over the place, this media release went out. I saw some, some Idaho newspapers picked it up and some other stuff. So it went all over the place. And it's just, can you identify these two individuals who killed a bull elk in Nevada illegally? And it was about four days later, we got an anonymous phone call that said, hey, check this kid out. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the name that we got back, and I'm just going to use the first name, um, is Zachary. I'm going to lose last name out of it, but take a look at Zachary. Mm. And so I started looking at his Instagram stories and uh, photographs and his Facebook, his social media accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I found a picture the day before this happened of him and this other kid who were heading out towards the Utah Nevada border. That was the statement to do on their elk hunt. So he had a Utah bull elk tag. Um, and this, this crime scene was about 12 miles into Nevada. Um, and so things started adding up a little bit, started looking at his criminal history. This was his very first year off a of revocation <laughs> for killing two deer on one tag in Utah. So we had a, a criminal history with poaching. Yep. So I started reaching out to some of his friends and trying to find that photograph. Cause if he killed this bull, he's going to be sharing that photograph to right. other people. And I found it really weird that he wasn't sharing it on his, his social media accounts. There were no pictures of this bull mm. that he had killed, but we looked at his harvest report that he had already done. And he said that he did kill a bull elk in that unit. So working with some other people and some friends, I was able to get a photograph of that bull that he claimed to have killed in, in Utah. And then started looking back at all the elk that were in the field subsequent days to that and got an exact match to the bull that he claimed to have killed in Utah and a bull that was in that field the day before during the day. And I got a really good photograph. His, his Royal, um, his G4 was split in an odd way. So it exactly matched up to the bull elk that was in the field <laughs> like a, a few days print. before the one that was on camera. Yeah. Um, and so we prosecuted him for that. We don't get, so in Nevada, we have gross misdemeanor slash felony statutes that we can use to prosecute poachers. And we don't, so if a person's convicted of a felony slash gross misdemeanor, it's called a wobbler. On, on sentencing, the judge gets to decide 
what it is. If it's a gross misdemeanor and a felony, and he gets to decide that based on the facts of the case. And this was one of the first felony convictions that we'd had in Nevada in a long time. We don't get a whole lot of those. So this case went really well. They actually pled down to that as a, so that he wouldn't get any jail time. So he didn't get any jail time for it, but he got six years rev- revoked or five years revocation. He can't hunt or fish on anywhere that honors a North American violator, wildlife violators compact. Mm-hmm. And then uh, a $20,000 fine, which was a really significant fine. We were able to give that to Operation Game Thief. And we were able to get, I think, 2000 of that that we gave back to the landowner who was instrumental in allowing us to get all that information right. and, and brought that to us. You know, we were able to get a reward out to him. And so that case kind of skyrocketed my career. Yeah. Um, and, and some of, most of it was just luck that that camera was there. It was a really great, great case that we worked, we worked hard on and we were able to put together a tremendous case. And then working closely with Utah DWR on that case, they were able to, give give us all the information on him and do interviews i went with them on when we first interviewed him and right um, just a tremendous case and the fact that we were able to get a felony out of it and then when we got the sentencing again there was a big media blast and it i think it went a long way in telling the kids in this area a lot we have a lot of problems with the young people in southern utah coming across and seeing nevada as the wild west (laughs) <laughs> you know, you can go over there and you can do whatever you want because, you know, there's one game warden out there or none. For a long time, there was no game warden out here. I think it went a long way in telling those kids, you know, hey, those guys take it serious. There's a dang good chance they're going to catch you. And there's some serious punishments that come with it. No so, doubt. It was a really, really great case. Yeah. No, that's uh, the significance of that trail camera is just, uh, it just blows my mind. But, you know, I think when I got, when I was getting done, I always told my guys, you know, act like you're always on camera because <laughs> you are. And sometimes yeah. you get out to go to the bathroom and you're like looking around. Like, ex- uh, <laughs> uh, oh, am I on camera right now? Yeah. Yeah, we, we were stashing a, a cruiser to run a decoy down the road at a seasonal house. And it was a very nice seasonal house. And the officer was like, you don't like this place. And I said, no, it's, it's fine. I'm just looking for the camera. So we both started looking for the camera. And sure enough, on the telephone pole, joining back in the house, there was that, 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 that camera. So we found it. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's, that's, and I'm sure they're fine with, you know, having a game wardens park in their driveway and, and, and that, and we actually made a, a shooting from the road case that day, right in that proximity. But it's, it's always on my mind now. Uh, where's that camera? And uh, for you, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if people understand when you saw that camera, it's, 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 you're excited, but you're like, is that on? Is the SD card filled? This, yeah. What what am I yeah. going to get out of this? The potential is huge, but what is it going to deliver? And then when you saw those pictures, ah, oh, that's just, you know, yeah. and, and then you're now you're thinking of everything else you got to do. That ATV, is there anything, you know, special about that ATV? Yeah. Is there anything special about those hats? You know, and you're we, trying to We dig tried into really it. hard to, like, I, I talked to the FBI, some other photograph analysis databases mm. to see if we could get those photographs cleaned up in any way to get a little more definition as to yeah. who, you know, who is this person? And we couldn't, I, they, they said, you know, based off of um, the fact that it's at night and the original quality is not great. This was before some of the really fancy cameras mm-hmm. that we have now that <laughs> have really high definition photographs. Right. It's sound was, you know, <laughs> kind of the newer versions or the older versions of trail cameras. So yeah, we weren't able to clean it up. But still, I mean, it was all there. Uh, and once we proved that was the bull, I mean, they had no defense. I mean, right. here, here are you. And then there was this photograph. One of the photographs depicted a, a really blurry symbol on one of his shirts that we were able to match up to his Instagram account <laughs> and show that he was wearing that shirt on that <sighs> night. Yeah. So, all the pieces yeah, were really, dropping in. That's, really neat. Yeah. That, that's... And not, you know, not all, not all cases end up like that. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> I, sh- I should say no cases end up like that. You don't, <laughs> yeah. you don't have a crime, like one of the biggest of your career in your area. I mean, this one matched all the criteria of uh, just nonsense mm. that comes with poaching at night with a spotlight, wasting all the meat, yep. private property, wrong weapon across state lines, across state lines. I mean, it was, it was the whole gamut of everything that we as game wardens try to, 
get out there and, and bust. And yeah. sometimes I think, you know, the good Lord cares about those cases. Yeah. And, and I think he cared about this one, that camera being there. Yeah. Um, that was no coincidence, you know, I so. totally agree with you. Totally agree. Something, sometimes he wants the good guys to win and there's a reason for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and th- since then I've, I've talked to this kid and I, I think this has gone a, a long ways in helping him turn his life around. Um, good. At least I hope it has. And I've seen him at some different places and he's, and he's since gotten married and, you know, has a kid and a job and, and things are, I think are going pretty good for him. Yeah. So I, I hope that that helped him realize, you know, I got to grow up. Yeah. I got to, I got to, you know, and, and families make this stuff seriously. a big difference. I think of one of the poachers I chased in my younger years and, and he's pretty flying pretty dang straight as far as I can see. And I asked him, I said, Hey, what, what, what changed? He's like, I had a kid and I didn't want him to hunt the way I hunted. I wanted him to be yeah. proud of the deer that he shot. Uh, I wanted him to be able to talk about that hunt and not, you know, that he whacked it at night and then took it into the you know, the barn and dressed it off and, you know, right. tagged it the next day or something. And, uh, you know, and then everybody knows you're a poacher. He goes, I don't want my kid to grow up that way. So that was a yeah. pretty, pretty substantial point in his life. And um, let, let's get back into your history because you shared that a little to me too and, and why you became a game warden, your first contacts with game wardens because uh, you got a little bit of that history too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a, an interesting history. Um, I uh, I grew up in a tiny little town called Matlock in Washington State. It borders right up on the Olympic Mountains. And you could definitely say I'm my dad's kid. My dad, from a very early age, he wasn't raised by hunters. He wasn't raised by outdoorsmen. He was raised in a suburban home with a mom and dad and brothers. And him and his brothers for some reason, just wanted to be outside all the time. Mm. And they didn't live in the middle of the woods. They kind of lived in a community. So he just had an affinity towards the outdoors and to hunting, but he had no mentors. Mm. Um, He had no one to tell him, you know, this is the right way to do it. And so, and his, his, his connection to the outdoors goes even deeper than that. It's more like a connection with survival, wilderness survival skills and, and stuff like that. So he was chipping arrowheads at a really young age, he was building mm. bows and arrows and hunting the neighbor's cats, <laughs> you know, just any, anything that he could do to, to get in the, in, in the wild. And, and so when he became old enough to have a car, he wanted to get out and go hunting. And he didn't, I, I don't think he even knew that there were laws uh-huh. um, at that age. He just knew, man, the, the native Americans, that's what they did. And so he, he built a flintlock muzzleloader rifle from scratch and said, I'm going to go kill a deer. And <laughs> I've, I've looked into this, so the statute of limitations is over. But the very <laughs> first deer that he killed, it was in Mount Rainier National Park. As like an 18-year-old kid, he went up into Mount Rainier National Park and and, and poached a, a, a doe and took it home and, and skinned it out. And I'm sure he knew it was illegal, but uh-huh. I don't. <laughs> that's just who he grew up as. And so I, I talked to him about this, and he was like, oh, yeah, and the elk too. And I was like, the elk? And he's like, yeah, I, I think I killed an elk in Mount Rainier National Park as well. <laughs> I was like, it was probably what? pretty good hunting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a national park. I mean, that's like going into Yellowstone and oh. um, poaching a, an elk in Yellowstone. Yeah. So, oh, but it was never, it was something. never big bucks. You know, it was never. It was dad wanting to be an outdoorsman and not really having any direction or anything. And so, hey, I, I saw a deer up there one time. I'm going to go shoot it with my homemade footlock. So, yeah. And so that's my connection to the outdoors is my dad's passion for Mm -hmm. anything related to wilderness survival and outdoor survival skills. And, um, he's a, he, I think he's really proud of what I've, what I've become. Mm -hmm. I know he's really proud now. He's a, I mean, he teaches outdoor survival skills at wilderness gatherings and, um, arrowhead shipping classes and all kinds of stuff. So he's really <laughs> gone that way. Nice. Um, my first, my, this is pretty interesting story. And I had to disclose this in my background investigation. So my dad, my very first time I ever met a game warden, I was probably nine years old and we passed, I passed under safety in, in, in Washington at the time. I don't know what it is now, but as soon as you could pass under safety, you could get a hunting license and you could go hunting. Mm. So again, my dad's still into the home laid flintlock muzzleloader thing. And so he built this, and he'd probably built 15 by 
the time I was older. Mm -hmm. Um, And so all us boys, our first deer were killed with flintlock muzzleloaders that dad built. Cool. And so I go out to fill this, fulfill this thing as a kid, you know, to go out with dad and kill the, your first deer with a muzzleloader. And I had seen a buck, a buck that day. I remember it like it's yesterday. And dad got me lined up on it. And I, it was the last day of the hunt. And and we were, we weren't very wealthy. So it, it meant a lot to get that meat. Mm -hmm. Um, it was last day and I got lined up on it. And for some reason I stuck my pinky inside the pan as I was resting (laughs) and that, that flintlock rock came down and, and just laid open my pinky and the gun didn't go off and the deer ran off. You can make a good argument. A nine-year-old shouldn't be shooting a deer, but anyway, I did. And I screwed up and the gun never went off and my finger was bleeding and we were going home. On the way home, there was a little apple orchard and dad saw some deer out there and it's my tag. And so he gets out and was like, I'm just going to fill your tag real quick. So in the headlights across the highway into an apple orchard on private property, he shoots this or he shoots at this doe and the doe runs off and and runs up and into the brush. And dad was like, I think I hit it, but I didn't hit it very good. Let's come back and, um, and look for blood. So the hunt's over. It was supposed to be, I mean, it's my tag. He obviously can't fill my tag. Mm -hmm. And he, we come back the next morning and we're sitting there and we're getting ready to hike out there and look for blood. And all of a sudden two game warden trucks come tearing in. They're like, Hey, you know, were you guys the ones here last night that shot across the highway at night? Uh, The neighbor here reported it, blah, blah, blah. And I'm remembering this because it was really scary. (laughs) (laughs) And, And my dad was like, my dad's really principled person when it comes to honesty Maybe not when it comes to poaching back then. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he was like, yep, that was me. And that beautiful flintlock muzzleloader, um, they seized it from him. He got a, a great big fine and got his hunting and fishing privileges revoked for five years. Wow. Um, I mean, it was a big deal for me as a kid. And that was my first it was my first time I ever met a couple game wardens. And yeah. Since then, we... We, I've talked to that game warden and he, I said, I was that kid. Do you remember that? And he was like, yeah, I remember that. It's really cool that you're a game warden now. So, yeah. Anyway, that was my first experience with game wardens was my dad getting put in handcuffs. So is that kind of when you, you thought maybe I'd like to do this someday, John, or no, no? not at all. I was like, those guys are jerks. Uh, <laughs> those <it's>... guys, <laughs> I was not. You know, I was scared. I was like, my dad's getting going to go to jail. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't take him to jail. They let him go home. But mm. yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'd have taken him to jail if I wouldn't have been with him. Because, you know. Then, uh, uh, possibility. Possibility. <laughs> what are we going to do with yeah. the kid? <laughs> right. Yeah, we're not going to take him to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, since then, I graduated high school and, and we were always – I think that straightened my dad up that experience, Mm. but I mean, growing up, we didn't have electricity. We lived in the middle of nowhere. Our our closest neighbors were, you know, a mile away or so. That's the way my dad wanted to live. He wanted to live in the middle of nowhere and live off the land and have a garden and and chickens and goats and and stuff and, and just live self-sufficiently. Yeah. And we had solar panels and we'd start up the generator to watch a movie or whatever. Um, and, I mean, my dad would give us, when we got home from school, my dad, we were allowed to keep our 22s in our room, Mm -hmm. but my dad would give us, he'd always keep the bullets. And so (laughs) he'd give us two 22 bullets when we got home from school or in the beginning of the day, you know, during the summer or something or on a weekend. And we'd be gone the rest of the day, just terrorizing the countryside. I can honestly say, you know, we'd, we'd shoot, probably shoot grouse out of season and, and, and do some different things. There were, it wasn't, I think it speaks to the importance of having mentors mm. for, for outdoorsmen and people to teach them how to do it right. Right. Cause I mean, my dad, he came into it with the, just the idea of, Hey, I want to survive off the land and more of a subsistence type right. mentality, which doesn't, it doesn't fit into the North, North American model of wildlife management, no. except maybe in Alaska, yeah, in Alaska, think- there's some subsistence lifestyles that, yep. that live that way. But I mean, down here we have game laws, we have, Right. You know, things that if every single person wanted to live that way, we'd have no game. And that came into question a lot with this whole COVID thing. I mean, 
our agency and many other agencies got questions on that where they were going to, you know, suspend deer season so everybody could go out and sustain. And you're right, yeah. it doesn't fit into the, the wildlife management plan because we would deplete our populations very quickly if we were trying to live mm-hmm. off of that because, we, frankly, we have too many people trying to live off a natural resource that it would, it would fail. So, but that certainly yeah. came into, and to knowing you were doing it back then is very interesting because a lot of people are gravitating back towards that right now. Yeah. So I, I, I graduated high school and I um, went to central Washington university for a couple of years. Didn't have a whole lot of direction, um, failed out of a lot of classes and probably had too much fun. <laughs> um, ended up kind of cleaning up and getting active in my church and deciding to go on a mission for my church and went to Canada on my mission, spent a couple of years up there, met a guy up there that kind of influenced me to be able to, he was a, he was a, a forest surveyor for in Canada. Yeah. And he said he loved his job. He spent his whole life out in the mountains. So that's kind of when I said, Hey, I want to do something like that. I want to be out in the mountains in some capacity because that's where my passion is. Mm-hmm. And then came home, went to school at Utah state university and got a job with Alaska Fishing Game. I uh, went up there to work on some houses and that kind of fell through and went down to the fishing game office and was like, hey, do you guys have a job? And they're like, yeah, we can put you out at a weir. So I lived at <laughs> a weir in the middle of nowhere for two summers and lived in a tent and counted fish and fished. And that's the first game warden that I ever shadowed was in that capacity. Nice. So I spent three or four days with a game warden up there who was working on some some guides up there that he didn't want to want he didn't want them to know he was there. So he was living at our weir kind of undercover Uh and and watching those guys and just making sure they were following the laws, but he was kind of posing as a weir worker. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I took him around and we kind of spied on them together (laughs) and, you know, got up on top of a mountain and, and just watched and made sure that they were following all the laws. And he, he ended up getting a pretty good citation out of it on, on some stuff that they weren't following. And that's where I was like, man, that's cool. (laughs) This guy, this guy gets to just play out in the mountains and, and do like detective work and, and, and do it in the capacity of the outdoors, which is where I wanted to be. Mm. And so I came home and I decided that's what I wanted to be. I came home from those two summers in Alaska. The second summer is when I hung out with that guy. Um, and then I dove right into it and I took all the law enforcement classes I could take. I ended up getting a wildlife degree from Utah State University. I interned with Utah DWR for a couple of years or for a couple of years. It was like six months. Mm-hmm. They have a law enforcement intern position. And I, nice. I did that. And I think I did a really good job. They wrote me a letter of recommendation and I, I got married right about that time to my wife and we decided, you know, these, these jobs are super competitive. Mm. I want to be a game warden. So any state <laughs> in the Western United States um, that opened up, we were going to apply for. I yeah. wanted to live in the West cause that's where my family is, but I was willing to, you know, any state, maybe except California. uh uh, so i yeah i just dove right into the application process and nevada was the first state that started hiring and so we applied there and i think i got hired about four months after i graduated that's awesome yeah and the rest is history i I got hired for a position down in boulder city in the city and didn't want to be there it's right outside Uh right outside las vegas and you're basically uh in that position you're a boating officer so you're in charge of life jacket enforcement and operating under the influence and drowning deaths and boat accidents and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And that's not really where I wanted to be. Right. So probably about two months after field training got over, this position came open and moved up here and I've been here ever since. Nice. Nice. And how long you, do you have on? Do. Huh? How long do you have on? How many years? Nine years. Nine years. Working on nine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I love the investigations part of it. That's, that's where my passion lies is, mm-hmm. you know, I write tickets and I actively patrol and stuff like that. But when, when there's a case like that case yeah. where there's a dead elk and no suspect, right. that's where I get excited. No doubt. You know? no doubt. That's where I, I really dive in and um, just attack a case like that with tenacity and mm-hmm. just do everything. It's something I've, I've always thought if there's a crime, there is evidence. Mm-hmm. There is evidence of that crime. There is a way to solve that case. And it's us to up to us to figure out, you know, how do I gather that evidence? Where's that evidence at? Right. So, and generally yeah. witnesses too. 
um, you know, whether they yeah. were told about the incident. Because let's face it, those guys that, that do this stuff and don't talk about probably never get caught. But most of them, they want, they want to tell people. They want to tell them yeah. <laughs> about this big elk. They want, to, they want to do that type of thing. So that, that certainly aids us, and it's just human nature. But I, I would agree. Yeah. I just the, the investigation part to, to start turning over rocks and, you know, you may turn over 100 rocks and all of a sudden you get a piece of information and it just, it sends you, it sends you to the rest. It's, you know, I, I got this piece and that leads you another piece to another piece and pretty much you're building a case. Just like that L case, you know, you go through, I mean, you start from the necropsy to, to looking for that bullet going through a soup, a stinky, nasty soup. But I don't know if listeners can really understand what that is about, but it is probably the worst this thing. One of our officers, I, I post, I don't know if I post the picture, he used to carry a, a hazmat suit with him, basically, and put his hazmat on to go into some of those things and he's he's smart <laughs> to do that because yeah. it's it's there's, there's the old trick of uh taking the vix vapor rub and run it rubbing it under your bottom lip yep so you, don't so have you to can smell. you have that intense <laughs> smell to kind of mask yeah you, you're gagging right i'm now. gagging her <laughs> i had a trainee once when he when he cut into the moose it blew his hair right back because there was so much pressure uh. in there and he spent the next 10 minutes gagging uh. <laughs> yeah i mean people don't realize that game wardens, we take a case from, you know, the tip to prosecution mm. to the whole thing. Like a police agency, when they have a murder, yes. there's 10 different parts of that agency that are working that case yes. from beginning to end. I mean, we do the job of the, the coroner. Uh, we do the job of the autopsy guy, the technician. We gather evidence. We take that case from nothing to prosecution or we don't solve the case. It's all up to us. We're, right. You know, that, that that's put on our plate. And that's what I love about this job is you watch CSI and that's what we get to do, but we get to do it in the mountains. Yeah. And we get to do it with elk and deer and, mm. and, you know, outdoorsmen. And, yeah. You know, sometimes the job sucks when you're, you know, you're dealing with the politics of stuff or, report writing and, and spending time in the office and crunching numbers but that all disappears when it's four in the morning and it's the opener of the deer hunt and you're watching the sunrise yeah you know, and you're just like man i get to do this for a living yeah i get to be up here i get paid to do what i'm doing right now yeah you know it's 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 inc it's an incredible career field it's definitely got its downsides my wife and i were talking about this last night I feel like sometimes it feels like your only friends are other game wardens, <laughs> you know, like yep. no one wants to get close to you. <laughs> like everyone's like cordial and nice or not. Some people absolutely hate you. Yep. Most people are pretty cordial. You know, mm -hmm. they say hi to you in the store and stuff, but no one wants to like spend meaningful time with you. Yeah. Who wants to hunt with like, a game warden, huh? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're all passionate about that. You know, we're yeah. all hunters or mm -hmm. most of us are. Most of us are. We want to be out there and we, we care a lot about, you know, being in the outdoors and harvesting quality animals and fishing and boating and, yeah. and all that. Yeah. Being but part sometimes, of Sometimes it. that's a tough part of the job is you feel, hey, no one, <laughs> no one really wants to get that close to you. Yeah. Now you got to treasure those good civilian relationships too. Because I think it keeps yeah. us balanced. I think all law enforcement should have, you know, a good civilian friend. Because you're right, some it has a tendency because that's when you start hanging out with, you know, your law enforcement friends, your game warden friends more often. And and sometimes I think we see things narrow mindedly. We put the blinders yeah. on, so to speak, and that 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 civilian friend you have uh, brings it back to reality. The guy that produces this show, Total Civilian, he's been such a, a mentor in just kind of guiding the other side. That now that I'm seeing that I'm retired a little more, that I'm actually kind of hunting with other hunters. Uh, they're getting a yeah. little more accustomed to hunting with a game warden because <laughs> now I have time to actually spend. But no, I, I think it brings us uh, some balance into our lives. So I think that's really important. That's pretty cool. 
So you've had some other cool cases too, huh? I mean, let's dive into some of these other cases because you have had a stellar career in nine years. Some of the stuff you shared with me, I, you know, I got excited about this elk case, and you've had some other dynamic things. So I still can't believe that camera was there, though. It's gonna, that's gonna be one of the top ten warden watch uh, case uh, reviews there. Uh, the the trail yeah. camera right right there on the fence post and. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I just, <laughs> yeah. It's one of those situations where you're like, no way. Yeah. Are you kidding me? It's like having a witness standing there watching the whole thing. But yeah, I, I, I've had a lot of success in this area. It sat dormant for I think five years without a warden at all. Mm. Um, and this, this area is, it's just prime for making cases because of the, the local culture um, is all about hunting and all about the acquisition of, big elk and big deer. And so that, that passion and that culture is always going to come with poaching and, and people doing it the wrong way to try to, to get that notoriety and that fame. Mm. Um, but just doing it, how it's not supposed to be done, how, you know, is a not sustainable way to do things. Right. Um, right now in the courts, I can't talk about these cases cause they're active, mm-hmm. but I have se- seven felony. And when I say I, obviously, you're the lead investigator County cases, yep. but no, and I, I, I try to take a mentorship role with a lot of the younger wardens. So mm-hmm. if I get a case and they're kind of in it, I, I like to try to keep it with them and then take it through. So right. cases that I'm working on right now, I think I have seven felony prosecutions that are going actively going on right now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, I think there's two more that are going to be added in the next few weeks for that. Mm-hmm. So that's a lot of, a lot of case report writing a lot of stuff. Another case I was going to talk about was one that happened back in 2013. It was the very first year I I got up here and I had absolutely no clue what I was doing when I got up here. (laughs) So this is this, this area I got, I mean, I got out of field training and most of my training was done on the boats on the water. Gotcha. So anything that I, and how much water do you have in your patrol? Huh? How much water do you have in your patrol? I have, Five little lakes, Nevada okay. size lakes. Nevada these size. Lakes are, I mean, you can't you can't water ski on these lakes. They're okay, more like <laughs> they're more of a yeah. pond. <laughs> yeah, there's decent fishing, but they're just they're little. Yeah, and so you know, I I was just kind of said, hey, go to town up there, have fun. And the closest warden to me is an hour and a half away, and he's in a different region, so he has a different command structure than me. Wow. The other ward, the wardens in Vegas are three hours away. So in a way, it was like super intimidating, but super fun at the same time, just learning a brand new area. I'd never been here before. I just knew there were big elk and big deer and (laughs) desert bighorn sheep, and that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. So this case was started by a Facebook post that was tipped to me, and it was a photograph of two does laying on the ground with three people looking, posing with these two deer. Um, And the timestamp on it's like April. And there's obviously no hunts in Nevada in April. And mm-hmm. so the guy said, hey, you might want to look at this. Yeah. So started looking into the individual that his Instagram account, and it was all in Spanish. So I was able to get it translated by uh, a Lincoln County deputy that um, knew Spanish. And we were able to find out that they were going to cut them up and eat them for carne asada. And they were going to have a big party. Um, so we knew that we had to get in there and get a warrant before all these deer got eight they were gonna have a big party and eat these deer so i'd never written a warrant worked with some wardens that had been on a while to you know how do i go about writing this thing called a warrant <laughs> <laughs> and uh so we we put together a warrant pretty quick and got in there um served the warrant it was my first warrant service and we found and we just found so much stuff in this house like a bag full of random songbirds and stuff that had all been processed like <laughs> tiny little, little, uh, like smaller than a quail, but like full size little birds, like a whole bag of them. We found lots of, lots of poaching type stuff, like spotlights and, and different stuff, but no deer. We didn't find any deer. Uh, but the guy that was there said, Hey, um, this guy came up from Las Vegas and he asked if he could hunt. And I told him yes, but I didn't know it was legal. These are all undocumented immigrants. Okay. Um, a whole group of them that were living in that area and none of them spoke English. And so we, we started looking at the, this individual who supposedly came up and we started looking at his social media accounts 
and and found out that there was this whole network of undocumented immigrants that were getting resident hunting privileges, hunting and fishing privileges, and buying deer and elk tags and just going to town on Nevada's wildlife. I mean, mm. their 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 Instagram and, and social media posts. This was before Instagram, so it would have been just Facebook. Yeah. Their Facebook posts had pictures of them holding swans, holding all types of different um, like loons and just random stuff that most people wouldn't even look at as, as game animals. And Basically if it was alive, they were killing it. Yeah. They were, they were going all over the state and we had something like 15 to 20 photographs of different animals that this group of, and it, it turned out being, I think close to six. It's been a while since this case, but I think it was six or seven guys all on the undocumented immigrants who were killing animals all over the state of Nevada, sometimes with tags, sometimes not with tags, but even the tags that they had were fraudulent because they could not have resident privileges. In Nevada, if you are a resident, you have a pretty good chance of drawing a deer tag. All of, all of our hunts here, there's nothing over the counter except for mountain lion. All of our deer, elk, antelope, bighorn sheep tags, these are all draw tags. And so they're extremely coveted, especially for different areas. Mm. Um, these areas right here as a non-resident, you, in, in unit 231, 22, I mean, you could put in for 20 years and not draw realistically. Wow. And so these people getting, as non-residents, getting resident tags and like they would get an area 22 tag and harvest it in 24 or an area 10 that's really easy to draw and harvest it in the wrong unit. And so we started looking at where this, there was one ringleader of this group. We started looking at his residence. He's the one that came up and, and shot the deer on the original photographs. So we, we started digging into him and his Instagram account or his Facebook account, found out that he's probably the, the ringleader of this outfit. And mm-hmm. so we got another search warrant and we teamed up with Las Vegas Metro on this one because this guy was a pretty bad guy. Mm-hmm. We knew that he had some ties to cartels and some other stuff down in Mexico. And so we, um, hit this house with Las Vegas Metro SWAT. <laughs> and uh, that was a really neat I bet. to watch. I mean, they, <laughs> they go hard. They go really hard. I mean, there's flashbangs breaking down doors, guys going in windows. Our, our whole job on this, the service of this warrant was to block the street off. I mean, we let the professionals do this one. Yeah. So um, they hit that house hard because of who the individual was. The house was a treasure trove of illegal big game. So mm. We, uh, an entire freezer in the back full of what we believe, I mean, individually packaged, you know, the look, not, not taken to a butcher right. done professionally, but just Ziploc, Ziploc bag bags Ziploc that bag they did themselves. Just random meat. Mm-hmm. Some of it's was ducks, it labeled? geese. Was it labeled no, out? It wasn't, it was just, in there. yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So we didn't, I mean, there was so much meat in there. We knew it was from multiple animals. Mm-hmm. And so we sent it off to a DNA lab. We sent off five samples from different parts of the freezer and they all, they came back to five different deer. Mm. So we didn't know, we still don't know how many right. deer were in that freezer. So we had a, a successful prosecution on, on all those guys. We got, uh, I think five or six gross misdemeanors, a bunch of misdemeanors, hunting, fishing privileges taken away from five or six different guys for a long time. And I think that case did a really good job of, letting undocumented immigrants know that just because you're here doesn't mean you have resident privileges in our state. Mm. So they have to apply as a non-resident if, if they're going to get those hunting and fishing privileges in Nevada. Yeah. And we, there was another part of that case that was really odd and we don't know what happened with it. There was a, when we, when we searched the house, there were multiple books of names after names, after names, after names of people. Uh, It was our belief that, this house, it was empty when we hit it. There was no one home, um, but it, there was lots of rooms with lots of different beds. I mean, the house could have slept. It probably should have only slept four people, mm-hmm. but it, it could have slept 20. We believe that it was a, um, like a safe house for human smuggling and human immigration and, and stuff like that, and that they were utilizing elk and deer and, and Nevada's wildlife to feed all these people that were in this, in this home, so... Mm. Pretty interesting case. That case was took about two years to investigate that case with wardens all over the state. Those photographs that we found on their accounts, we 
sent those out to wardens who patrolled those areas that we thought they were in. And we matched a lot of those photographs up to the exact spot where wow. they took those photographs with rocks that were laying on the ground and litter that was still there and, you know, a tree in the background. We were able to match all those up and really find out where they had killed those animals at and where the illegal tags they had, what area they were for. Hmm. So, and that was like one year on in my career. That was a really great case. Yeah. And then props to the, the wardens that were on 10, 15 years at that time that really took that case and took it places I probably couldn't have done. Like that case started in, in Nevada and Lincoln County with the tip that was given to me. But the older wardens and the more experienced wardens took that and, and just ran with it and made some tremendous cases. And I think that case has probably done a lot in that um, Hispanic community of, of Las Vegas and letting everyone know, you know, what you have to do to be able to do this right. Mm. So absolutely. Really that, great case. Yeah. And it's funny how that, that just rings through. I mean, the case we did across the border with Canada, again, had a very bad, big impact in that same type of community. So I can totally see what you're saying is a, it, it rings true to a different, a different, it reaches different people to a different way. Yeah. And that's probably pretty much the only way you can reach them because they don't really, they don't want to strive to do it the right way. And if they are feeding them, that's why I was wondering about labeling. I, I wonder, you're probably absolutely right. Cause what, what do they care if it's elk, deer, um, yeah. goat, if you're feeding it to a smuggling, you know, human trafficking, if you're feeding that out, yeah. you don't care. If you want to have a piece of elk, you're, you're going to write elk on it, no matter if you butcher it or someone else butchers it. So that lends a, yeah, if you, and again, timing's everything and you could have hit that right and had a whole bunch of human smuggling. Uh, did you guys recover yeah. drugs out of that house? I'm just curious. Cause that usually runs mm -hmm. over. No. Huh. Not that I remember. I don't remember recovering any drugs. Yep. No, it wasn't a, it wasn't a residence. And that became very apparent right away. It wasn't that someone lived there all the time. Ah. So it was just a, like an empty house. <laughs> and that, that take with that, all that stuff was turned over to ice. Yeah. I honestly don't know what happened from there mm. as far as what they did with that information and stuff. Certainly took a cog out of their system though, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and that that's a result of uh, just uh, some pictures on Facebook that are sent yeah. to you to, to again start that investigation and and then another award. And that's how it is with most of these cases. You know, we start with a little tip. Yeah, and and it just grows and grows and grows into something that you never knew it was going to go. It's amazing how some of these cases turn out. And where the, where there's one, there's probably five. <laughs> right. But it's great that you bring that to the listeners, telling them about how our case is actually, we're the CSI there, we're collecting all that evidence, we see it through, we've sent it to the DNA lab, they send it back to us, now we're matching, we have, you know, five different deer that come out of that freezer, now now when we're prosecuting it, that this, this five deer that we can prove, it's just, you know, it's watching that CSI and bringing it from the, the crime to the court and that's what game wardens do i mean some of the best training i had was homicide school i went to a homicide school made for people and i applied that to animals and it was a, a dynamic course uh and then we as game wardens have some of those uh you know pennsylvania has a great course on uh forensics you know taking doing the csi stuff and a lot of yeah. the states take advantage of their expertise and send officers there to get that expertise to bring it home so we can collect it and we know how to collect it. We know how to label it and, and taking that time. And with hunter-related shootings as well, uh, so detailed the investigation has to be. And sometimes it may be a murder, and you're probably working side-by-side -side with maybe a homicide detective and doing the same type of work because you don't know until the, the absolute end. So it's it's really yeah. interesting that you brought that out, and then you can share you know, from the beginning to the end, of, you know, especially with these cases that are so detailed, John. You know, that, that you're actually picking DNA. You're actually identifying the individual elk by, you know, a fork on his left G4. You know, that's, yeah. you know, it's a, that's the fingerprint. That's the fingerprint. That's yeah. the, the identification. And that's, uh, that's great work. And just, yeah, it gets me fired up and that, that, that you're doing this work, that game wardens do this work nationwide, you know, and that people listening from Maine to, to Washington State, we, we do it very similarly everywhere. 
And I'd say we're all cut from very similar cloths because when I hang out with them, uh, you know, these are my brothers and my sisters, and that's uh, <laughs> and it feels like home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, some of the coolest classes I've taken on forensics are the forensic entomology, where you're working with maggots, and you know, ma- you just look at a pile of maggots and you think there's not a lot of evidentiary value there. But I mean, yeah, what stage from, are they in? <laughs> yeah what stage are they in you can get a time of death yeah. from that and know exactly when this went down based on the maturity of those eggs and different types of bugs that are there yeah um, we're not just a bunch of you know hunters that got hired we have, we have degrees you know mm. we we're most of us are, are pretty smart guys you know that that work really hard at our craft and utilize whatever resources are available no doubt and, and those resources are constantly changing so mm. we're going to classes to learn how to work with technology um yeah and, and develop develop suspects from that stuff bullet forensics and ballistics and mm. um, digging bullets out of a carcass and be able to identify which 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 gun that came from right you know? And you're right, the change in technology. When I went to photography school at the academy, you know, it was uh, film, <laughs> you yeah. know. And, and through the progress of years, you know, the digital photography, always having a camera with you because it's on your phone now has been awesome, awesome towards the end of my career. I'm taking, you know, and take as many pictures as you want. You know, it was you're going to have to have that film developed, and it costs a lot of money, and the department really doesn't want to do that. So just don't don't take as many pictures as you want. Take just the, yeah. the perfect picture every time because you're, you're no, only going to get one completely thing. completely changed, and yeah. we take thousands. <laughs> thousands. Delete what doesn't. Video. <laughs> yeah. uh, some technology has been awesome, awesome for sure. Yeah. Any other cases, especially I, for sure? Okay, let's just jump right into the third one I wanted to go over and this one just got adjudicated so this one's really fresh in my brain awesome um and it gets into a little bit of the technology that we use you know we don't want to give out all our secrets and that's where the future of of all this is is working with technology and developing uh suspects in ways that 10 years ago was was even not even thought of Mm. so uh so this case happened in 2017 Uh, we didn't find out about it until 2019 so in 2017, a kid came across the Utah-Nevada border from the St. George area, came into some of our prime winter range, an area called Bunker Pass, which is way out in the middle of nowhere, but right on the Utah border and much more accessible from Utah than from Nevada. Mm. And a lot, of the, a lot of these bucks from Nevada and Utah go down and will rut in this country. And you know how it gets. We don't, we don't hunt deer for the most part during the rut because they just get that dumb. <laughs> um, you can drive up to a, a big group of, of bucks and does during the rut and they could not care less that you're there. They're doing their thing. They're fighting. They're, you know, pushing does around. Whereas three weeks before that, you come within half a mile of them and they're running. So uh, we don't hunt deer for the most part, except for a few units and a few tags during the rut because it would just be too easy they're just sitting there on the side of the road and everyone would kill a big buck and mm. there wouldn't be any deer left that's so, the only time we can hunt eastern can't... white tails because that's the only time we can get them because they're too dang smart any other time so we need to get them when they're dumb yeah. <laughs> out out here it's i mean we use our eyes for the most part we're glassing you know across yeah space and, so different and then sneaking and then sneaking in on them yeah so this kid came across during the rut in December and um, there was a, a giant buck, um, he was roughly 200 inches, uh, just sitting on the side of the road. He got out, shot it, um, cut its head off, and then went back to Utah, took some photographs of, of the deer and, and figured he'd gotten away with it. Figured, you know, two years have passed, I'm probably good to go. No one knew about it. We got a tip. Um, we got a tip that told us, hey, this kid, actually, no, I'm going to backtrack from that. Utah got a tip. And this goes into the fact that these states, we work really well together, right. especially with populations that are closer to my area I patrol than Las Vegas or some of our metropolitan. Mm. So Utah got a tip um, that said, hey, here's a photograph of this buck that he killed. 
he killed this deer in Utah during December when there were no hunts. And so Utah started looking at it, pulled what, this is the one technology I'll get into a little bit that we utilize, but photo, most people know about this now, but photographs contain metadata, right? If you, if you snap a photograph, a lot of times there's a GPS coordinate that comes with that. They started looking at the metadata of this photograph and said, hey, that's in Nevada. That's not in Utah. So they called us up and said, hey, you know, we got this photograph. We got this tip. It looks like this really big, beautiful deer was killed out in Nevada in 2017. And we started looking at the statutes and, and knew we had less than a year left to get this thing investigated, get it submitted and get it prosecuted before the statute of limitations expired, which would have been three years. Mm. We immediately went to the GPS coordinate that was on that, on the metadata of that photograph and, and found um, the carcass missing the head. I mean, it, at this point it was bones and, and stuff, but we were able to match up that photograph again to a rock that was on the ground and, and, a, and the bush and, yeah. and the bones that were still there and a, a tree that, that come across in front of it. And we actually collected that little branch that matched up exactly the photograph as evidence. That's awesome. Collected the bones and put together a tremendous case on, on this one. After, I think it took us about three months to do all of our interviews and, and find out about this deer. We went and interviewed him. He denied it and lawyered up right away and said, you guys don't have nothing. Get out of my property. And that was a lot. It was, he was in Utah. So we did that along with Utah. And we ended up taking that case, presenting it to the district attorney. District attorney said, yeah, let's go with this. Prosecuted it. Our witnesses, I'm not going to divulge who they are but our witnesses were fantastic in this case. Mm. Uh, there's so much pressure from, from individuals who commit crimes on those individuals. A lot of times these people, you know, can be really intimidating. And a lot of people don't co- want to come forward with that information because they are afraid of the consequences and repercussions that can come from being a snitch or a narc or, or whatever. Right. But the, the witnesses in this case were completely willing to do whatever they needed to do to bring this to a prosecution. The individual wasn't alone when this happened. So there was someone with him that was willing to talk about it and just completely instrumental. That I can't, I can't give that person enough credit and I wish I could give them more credit, but I'm going to leave them out of it. Mm-hmm. So they were willing to testify. We went to the prelim trial and went really well. The problem right now with, with COVID and all this is that we, we have a hard time during ju- doing jury trials. They don't want juries sitting in boxes next to each other mm. in tight spaces. So I think district attorneys right now have more of a, a motivation to plead things out mm-hmm. and to not take it to a trial. And so right. this case was pled down and we were, we were really sad about that. I, I felt it was a, a solid felony if we could have got it to a jury and really giving them all the facts of the case and showing them how big the deer was and how important that resource is to our county. It would have been a Lincoln County trial, but people here know how important that resource is to our county. Mm -hmm. Economically, aesthetically, everything. I mean, a a buck like that doesn't come around a lot. Mm. So what ended up happening was they, they pled it down to a gross misdemeanor. So the felony wasn't on the table anymore. And then a $15,000 fine, which is a significant amount of money. Mm-hmm. And then he had to give the head back to us. And we went to sentencing. I, I think props to the, the judge on this one, but we don't usually get uh, jail time from our cases. Mm-hmm. Usually you work really hard on a case and you think, man, this one, this one deserves, this guy needs to spend a little bit of time in, in jail for what he did. And it wasn't even recommended from the district attorney, but the judge said, $15,000 fine, gross misdemeanor, 100 hours of community service, and 20 days in jail. And everyone was like, wow, mm. that's incredible. You yeah. Know, 20 days in jail. That, I mean, a lot of times money, especially if someone's pretty affluent, doesn't mean a lot. Right. You know, you know daddy will take care of it, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, I, I don't feel this. I don't feel, you know, the punishment for what I did. But 20 days in jail for a young kid. Yeah. Um, that, that matters to mm. them. So he ended up getting a, a, a 20 day j- uh, jail sentence and he's actually serving that right now. So, huh. yeah. Congratulations. Tremendous case. Yeah. yeah. 
brought that one to prosecution. It ended up being a gross misdemeanor, and we wanted it to be a felony, but that 20 days in jail is yeah, just as sweet. That, that's huge. That's huge, and hopefully that'll change. And, and you're right. Jail time and losing your hunting privileges are the two things yeah. that, that level out the playing field if you have a lot of money because those guys yeah. usually don't mind paying the fines, but when they lose their hunting privileges because most of them love to hunt or they ought to go to jail, that just levels the playing field. Now now it doesn't matter who you are or, right. or how much money you have, uh, those things affect you. So, And I think that that's good when it comes to wildlife law enforcement that we have those tools. And like you said, you brought up the, the compact, the, the North American law enforcement compact, where if they lose their license in your state and we have similar rules, they lose their license everywhere that has similar rules. So, and that's we all have... State, but like- Rhode Island, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Is there one state that doesn't recognize that or something? Once I, the last I knew, I think it was New Jersey, and don't quote me, they were working on getting that Good. rectified. Massachusetts and New Jersey, I believe, were our last ones, and they were both in process. So I'm not sure where that stands today. I'll have to do an update on that, but uh, and maybe even talk about that on Warden Swatch with some of the, the founders of that pack, because that came out of International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. Some of the founding members started that, and to, just to see it come together is huge, because it's Canada, North America, and right. it, it takes your hunting privileges away everywhere. It's just not in your yeah. state, because that used to be the big thing. You know, I lose my licenses, I go to the next state and go hunting here. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. You really lose your license. You really lose your hunting privileges, period. Yeah, that means a lot to people that enjoy hunting in the outdoors. To have that effect on them certainly is a big deal. So I have to go to Africa or somewhere else if they're that affluent. So <laughs> Mexico, a lot of them do go to Mexico these days. Really? Huh, I wasn't aware <clears throat> yeah, of that. There's a lot of really good coos deer and um, mule deer hunting in Mexico. So mm. a lot of them go down there to still hunt. I've worked some tremendous cases. Yeah. Um, and maybe hit me up in a, about a year and I'll, I'll tell you about the one that's going through the court right now. Yeah. You got a lot in process, start, which will be really cool. Started off as one. And I'm, I think we're, that case is morphed into five, five huh. different big game animals that have been poached. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah. And any sheep uh, in that too? Cause uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd love to hear a sheep case at some point. <laughs> Man, our sh- I, we don't get a lot of really nefarious cases with sheep. Our sheep hunters, I mean, our, our success rate is like 90% or greater. Wow. Most of the guys that draw those sheep tags are, you know, they've been putting in for 20, 30 years mm. and and take it really seriously and really yeah. know what they're doing. You don't get you don't get your casual hunter, your weekend warrior out on the sheep hunt usually. Right. So, I mean, we, we definitely worked some pretty good cases, but nothing in my area, mm. not, nothing that I've, I've been instrumental enough in to be able to talk about. Yeah. Jeff, I just, different animals have different, like you said, different investigations, different, uh, I just haven't had a sheep case yet. So I guess I'm going to start looking for a sheep case. So maybe another <laughs> warden will hear this on the, the warden's watch podcast and say, Hey, I got a good sheep case <laughs> reach out just like uh, Victor did w- w- with your cases, John. And, uh, I certainly really appreciate that. Cause, uh, yeah, we had some dynamic stories today and thank you so much for sharing your growing up, sharing, allowing in your dad, allowing you to share his story. Uh, I think that's an awesome transformation type story um, and, and to see a different way about coming about it. You know, that survivalist ship, that uh, sustaining type uh, mentality probably started off with your dad and, you know, not really thinking. But yeah, and again, being super honest and, and admitting to the game wardens that that was him the night before, that, uh, that, that, that says a lot uh, right there. Uh, and then having that effect on you as a young kid. And then turning around in Alaska by participating and getting out there and uh, the sneaking and peeking, the, the watching, uh, sitting on the mountaintop, glassing uh, what those guys are doing and uh, getting that fire built up in you and saying, man, this is something I like. And, and continue nine years of investigation and, uh, you know, putting these cases together for the state of Nevada. But, you know, for everybody that loves resources, wildlife resources, it's just a awesome thing that, you know, we all do because we all have a passion for it. And uh, no, thanks a lot for sharing because uh, th- it's very special and, and that background especially was very special. So appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Thanks again, Wayne. Yeah. No, great. So 
we'll uh, sign off on this and uh, yeah, we'll wait for those cases to adjudicate and we'll be back, man. Thanks, John. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.